Hello again, this is uh, Michal Martin, uh, Tónishta, uh, and leader of the Fianna Fáil Party. Welcome to the latest uh, episode of my podcast. And today, as we come close to budget time, I'm very anxious to discuss a range of issues that affect the ordinary people of this country uh, on a daily basis, particularly over the last 18 months, the cost of living, uh, the economy, uh, and where it stands now. And today I have a UCC lecturer uh, in economics, uh, Seamus Coffey, and has spoken publicly and written many articles on the Irish economy, uh, threats and challenges. Um, Seamus, very welcome uh, to this podcast. Thanks so much, Thomas, could I ask you at the outset um, if you could sort of give your uh, assessment of the Irish economy right now um, and also threats and challenges ahead? Yeah, I suppose a, a very broad question to begin with. Like, there's always going to be issues, challenges, risks and problems in the economy. If we take the Irish economy just in overall terms as we look at it now, the performance has been remarkable. Uh, and the performance has been remarkably positive, uh, particularly given what the Irish economy has gone through, of course, with the crash of 15 years ago. We've had COVID. We've had the uh, in, in Russian invasion of Ukraine and the associated energy price shock. Uh, but the Irish economy has come through all these issues remarkably well. Yes, it took a while to get over the 2008 crash, but we thought maybe that, that COVID and the energy shock might have a, a longer term impact on the economy. But if you look at sort of metrics that aren't really influenced by some of the sort of issues that arise with Irish economic statistics, just take employment uh, mm. and the, the growth and, and the um, maintenance of employment uh, over recent years. Uh, we're now over 2.6 million. Like you go back to the early 1990s, total employment in Ireland was just reaching a million. Uh, we're now at, at 2.6 million uh, and much higher than it was, a couple of hundred thousand higher than it was back in 2019. Can we see evidence of that elsewhere? Well, I'm sure we get to talking about tax in a while. But one tax that sort of maybe is under the radar in recent times has been income tax uh, and just a strength and, and the revenue being generated from income tax, particularly the monthly returns, which are by and large based on PAYE. Um, taxpayers. Yes, you have the, the surge in November with, with the self-employed, but month on month we're seeing remarkable levels of income tax come in uh, and the growth there has been quite strong. And if you look at our sort of our financial position, which again is something we might get into, like unusually for Ireland, we're running an overall surplus. From an economist's perspective, one of the key things we'd look at is what we call the balance of payments. The net flow of money in and money out, going back to sort of a historical reference, essentially are we living within our means um, and we've had problems before with that, where our overall spending exceeded our overall income. But if you look at the Irish economy now, uh, our overall income uh, is much greater than our overall spending. Between the government running a surplus, households um, saving money, we're probably looking at being in somewhere around 20 billion below our level of income. Now, we could say that some of that income is uh, subject to uncertainty particularly that income arising via corporation tax. But it does leave us in a pretty strong position. We have strong employment. Um, the unemployment rate is low. We have strong income growth. Um, and if you take household measures, like just one final one, um, going back over the last 20, 30 years, we now have low, lower levels of inequality, income inequality, yeah. than we had in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, so I think if you were to look in overall terms, again, we can come into some of the, the issues that are clearly there. Uh, the performance of the economy has been pretty remarkable. Yeah, we've had declines in income inequality and an increase in personal uh, incomes. And I think very few countries, are, are you aware of any other countries who have more or less achieved that? Um, in, 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 yeah, in and there was actually times. an interesting, um, the ESRI launched a report last week and one of the presenters was Professor Brian Nolan from Oxford, uh, who put up a, a very interesting chart about changes in income inequality over the last 30 years and real median household income growth over the same period. And Ireland was sort of in a quadrant of a sector of this chart all on its own. It has achieved very high levels uh, of real income growth. That's inflation adjusted income growth and had seen a decline uh, in income inequality. And I think in Professor Brian Nolan's chart, there was no other country in the quadrant uh, of that chart that reflected that. Other countries had strong income growth, but that w had come with higher income inequality. There were other countries that had um, modest increases or reductions in income inequality, but had seen relatively low uh, income growth, where in Ireland we seem to be a bit of an outlier. We had the high income growth and also had a reduction in income inequality. So sort of at a household level over a 20, 30 year period, uh, that is something which is quite noteworthy. That's very interesting. <clears throat> That's very interesting research, which sometimes doesn't get reflected in the, the everyday narrative. And in terms of that economic uh, development and progress, if you look at it over, uh, I suppose, a 50 to 60 year time frame, we have quite an entrepreneurial pro-enterprise policy, particularly in terms of attracting FDI into the country uh, and then endeavouring to develop 
individual, or sorry, indigenous enterprise, sometimes on the back of the FDI, in other words, supply chains, developing companies, li- gaining expertise and expertise as a result of either uh, working with these companies in terms of project management or in uh, various services that they supply. Uh, yet there is uh, an enormous um, sort of dependence, maybe the wrong word, um, on the FDI sector. Uh, do you see that as a threat or a challenge? Or how can we get a more significant indigenous growth of, of, of global companies? We, we, we mm-hmm. have significant success in the food industry, particularly the Gambias, the Kerry groups, and so on like that. Maybe not to the same degree in life sciences or, or technology companies. Yeah, I think sort of your maybe difficult area in getting the appropriate words to describe it sort of reflects the the nature of it. Like, is it a risk or a challenge? Well, really, it's only a risk or a challenge because of the success of it. Like, if we didn't have such levels of FDI, if we didn't have the employment, the investment, and now the corporation tax, would it really be on the agenda? Uh, and we have seen like huge success, particularly with US multinationals. A kind of historical interplay between tax systems has meant Ireland has been traditionally attractive for US companies seeking to have a footprint abroad. And like they now have a huge footprint here. Like if we talk about 2.6 million people working in Ireland, about 175,000, 180,000 of those are direct employees mm-hmm. of US multinationals. And if you look at their pay bill, their pay bill is 12 or 13 billion. Uh, so you're looking at an average uh, of around 70,000. So that is a huge amount of employment and a huge amount of high paying uh, employment. And that's just the direct employees. As you say, there also will be ancillary services like they have to buy things from IRA suppliers, but there's things like um, maintenance of grounds, security, uh, catering, professional services, quality control, logistics, distribution, a whole range of things. Uh, and on that 175,000, you could add uh, many more jobs being directly linked to FDI. Is that an issue? Well, it's clearly a risk just because of the size of it and the contribution it's yeah. making. But I think much better to be having this employment, to be having these jobs, to be having this income rather than having not having them. As we're looking at the, at the IDA and we're looking at the pipeline and we see a numerous announcements being made around the country of significant investment, particularly in the in the, the pharmaceutical sector, like where there's huge multi-billion euro plants being put up. Uh, um, and, and like we see them in Cork, there's a huge development ongoing in Limerick. And like these are huge investments uh, that are here for a 20, 30 year period. Yeah. Um, like they're not going to put that money into a plant and shut it down after five years. I think that's, that's a fair assessment. I mean, my sense is that particularly during COVID, I would, met, I would have met with a lot of the life sciences companies and their CEOs. They found Ireland a very reliable partner in terms of not losing any production during COVID. And also the workforce uh, has, has progressed, has added value. Many of the Irish workforce uh, go up that ladder in terms of the, the corporates and, and, and end up in the US and elsewhere, leading those companies at, at different levels and in all sectors. Um, and, and so they are fairly embedded, or, uh, but nonetheless are subject to global change. One further factor is geopolitically, there's more nearshoring going on because of concerns mm. over the Taiwan Straits and so on, and maybe over dependence on chips and other and, and, and life sciences in, s- in certain parts of Asia. So there could be actually a rebalancing which could benefit Ireland. But on, on the broader, on the indigenous side, um, what's your sense of have we maximised the potential of indigenous, uh, indigenous Irish companies to become truly global players? Yeah, I, I don't think we can get away from the fact that there is a conflict between the, the foreign investment and the in- indigenous sector in Ireland. Like, Given the nature of the employment, the size of the employment, the earnings that are available there, it's likely that some of our more entrepreneurial, some of our more innovative people are going into the FDI sector. Maybe not all of them. Uh, and But as you say, they are moving up along the ranks. Um, and they are, in, in some cases, empire building. Like, h- how do these investments come to Ireland? Well, somebody from Ireland has to pitch it. So whether it's a senior manager, a plant manager, a country manager, right. will be going to the headquarters in the US and saying... You're going to build a one and a half billion plant. We have a site for it here. We think this is the best location for it. And then link it up with the professional services, link it up with the legal, the tax side and make a pitch. And that's been entrepreneurial and they are attracting that investment. So I think it's unavoidable that there is uh, a certain conflict there, that if you have such huge numbers uh, working in the FDI sector, that innovation, that talent isn't necessarily available for, for the indigenous sector. And we can also see it like in terms of providing domestic services. Like we're essentially making stuff for the rest of the world, whether it's in pharmaceuticals, in IT, medical devices, computer chips. We're a huge manufacturing um, base for those companies. Uh, and we're making a lot of these goods for export. Maybe given the, the tight labour market we have, we'd like more people maybe perhaps building houses or providing medical services to residents here. Uh, but that is a difficult conflict to, to, to balance. So I, I think it's there. There's no doubt it's there. Um, but the FDI 
it, it, I think it's better to be having it uh, rather than looking for it. Ag- agreed. And in terms of the tight labour market, I mean, if you look at the economy right now, it looks at f- uh, it's going at uh, full tilt uh, and pace. Uh, there are constraints in terms of the labour market. I, I suppose in some respects that highlights the importance of a of mobility of labour within the European Union from an Irish context, it's beneficial uh, and a flexible work permit system in terms of outside of the EU coming into to Ireland to work. Sometimes that can be a difficult message to deliver mm. domestically, politically. Um, but if you look at the successful countries over the over the decades and historically, it is those countries that can develop its own human capital and attract ca- human capital in, in, in to keep the wheels of industry motoring and to keep services going. Yeah, and like one of the sort of outcomes of the success the economy has had, the growth in the population, is that for some parts of, of the, the country and the nation's infrastructure, we've sort of outgrown our clothes. Like, so we, while Ireland is an attractive place to come to, uh, it, it does result in difficulty, say, on the housing side, uh, where there, there are sort of a, a, a lack of, I mean, across a whole range of, of different types of housing. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that um, is because of the, the attractiveness. People want to stay here. People want to come here. Like Ireland in the 1980s didn't have a housing crisis. No. We had huge outward migration. Uh, we didn't have climate crisis. Yeah, climate crisis. It was yeah, a, yeah. Your, your, your housing yeah. stock, um, much of it will be... Uh, left idle whereas at the moment we have the opposite pro- problem it's a good problem to have again going back to some of these things but it, sh- it is something that, that we should be looking to see ca- how do we address it on the housing question I mean yeah the population is growing uh, we're not building enough houses fast enough really to deal with the problem that's facing many younger uh, people although there are some improvements we, we would argue in the last year or two in terms of increased momentum and commencements and completion but how do you see uh, the housing issue what would your criticisms be what would your analysis be in terms of how we get housing output delivered mm. faster um, for the, 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 the people that need it. Yeah, I suppose housing is, is one of those slow burn issues that the problems d- develop slowly and then c- tend to happen very quickly and the solutions also can seem to happen slowly. Uh, and I think from, from a, a domestic policy perspective and maybe from a bit of self-reflection from, from economists in the country, uh, there must be recognition that maybe some of the analysis undertaken 12, 15 years ago uh, was pretty much wise of the market. If you were to go back uh, and look around 2010, 2011, a lot of the narrative and talk from uh, economists in the country was that we had too much housing uh, and that we would spend a number of years knocking houses. Um, and in, in that context, it's perhaps natural uh, that our house building sector would simply dry up. That If the view is that we have too much, why would we devote scarce resources as they were at the time? back in 2000 and 2011, 2010, 2011, uh, to building houses. Clearly, that analysis was incorrect. Uh, and a number of years later, n- not many years later, uh, we found ourselves returning to growth, returning to employment, returning to inward migration, um, with uh, a younger population coming through in their 20s and 30s, uh, looking to form households where simply the houses weren't available, the housing units uh, weren't available. So the problems have built up over a period of time, and now the solution is kind of slow enough and coming through as well. Where should we be looking for the answers? Well, I suppose from, from the government side, the key sector is social housing. Uh, like our housing sector has sort of three bits to it. There's the owner occupiers, there's the social housing, and then there's the, the private rental. Uh, and the government clearly should be focused on, on the social housing and delivering more units there because the more units you deliver there, that the, you're taking the pressure off uh, other parts of it. When it comes to the private sector, providing units for, for private rent, providing units for purchase, I think at times we can sort of get... Um, sort of paralysis by excessive policies. We're always waiting for, oh, the government might do this. They could cut VAT or reduce VAT on new housing units. They might offer a, a subsidy for landlords. And you can find people maybe waiting to see what will happen. And there's lots of stuff happening. But we never get to the end point where we say, like, this is it now. This is the playing field. This is what you're faced. So maybe a, a bit of certainty um, might actually help. I know people want things done and we want things done now. Um, but when it comes to investment, we spoke about FDI investment, like one thing they look for is certainty. Uh, and Ireland has built up a good reputation offering that. Uh, maybe in housing, if we could just settle down and say, this is the playing field, let's see what's going to happen. One of the difficulties there has been the response to the private sector, from my experience over the last number of years, in the sense that, OK, government is saying we'll get to 10,000 per annum. Um, in fact, it'll be 12,000 social houses per annum, or, uh, sorry, this year. Uh, made up of build uh, and acquisitions uh, and some minor uh, degree of, of, of leasing. But of course, um, then the government has entered into the scene in terms of land development agency, in terms of affordable housing schemes, all designed to try and uh, incentivize uh, and create a, a affordability for younger people to be able to buy houses and, uh, along the principle of home ownership. 
the private sector have argued in terms of compact living, for example. So we have the climate environmental concerns saying we need less sprawl, we need more inner city mm. compact developments. Private sector is saying can't deliver those uh, on a viable basis. And I think you, you, you have a point when you say a line has to be drawn under this and saying here is the framework now. Um, and that tends to be the dilemma facing government in terms of getting activity on the private side. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Like from a sort of a, an urban development perspective, what's more attractive developing an inner city or a close to inner city brown field site or going out to a, a green field site in the outskirts and expanding the, the scale of the city again? Clearly, we would like to see more inner city development. Is that more expensive? Potentially, yes. Do you have to do it perhaps to a, a higher scale, a higher density with additional costs? Again, potentially, yes. But if things keep changing, if the rules keep changing in terms of sizes, in terms of um, different requirements, uh, you might just see people waiting up and say, oh, the rules could be relaxed in two, three years' time. Uh, we'll wait for that to happen. Like, I wouldn't necessarily be a huge expert in housing, but I can see uh, the impact that the housing system is on, particularly on students. Like, I, I work with, yep. with students in, in UCC. It's very difficult to get. And what is needed in, in Cork, and I'm sure other cities, is actually more student-specific uh, um, accommodation. accommodation. And you'll hear arguments against that, oh, we should be building uh, homes for people to, to the family home. We should be using a resource. And yes, we have scarce resources. But if we provide more student-specific accommodation, that actually frees up. Students have of to course, stay somewhere. Less pressure. That, that actually frees up a, a accommodation elsewhere. So, like, we're short of everything. Um, and we're also, as we said at the start, maybe perhaps short of labour. The economy is going so well. So how do we attract people uh, into the sector to actually undertake the, the activity we want? And which is which is housebuilding? I'm not saying there's an easy answer. Uh, like, to say that the state should focus but on again, social housing and maybe try to limit all the changes that are happening that's only been said on the outside. Like when you're there faced with either people trying to build houses or people trying to buy houses, but again, um, it's, it's a very complex again, issue. the universities came back to us and said, we can't do it on our own anymore. We can't develop uh, on-campus student accommodation uh, um, financially. Uh, it's not viable. Now, the government has intervened. Again, <laughs> the mm. Minister for Higher Education came forward with proposals, I think in respect of three universities, that we would provide a fund to underpin, if you like, create the viable projects that would create um, accommodation um, on, on, on campus. In other words, there seems to be a sense at the moment, and probably reflects what you're saying in one way, that all the sectors out there are waiting for government intervention to sort of prime uh, developments in different in different mm. sectors. In, in, in that overall um, sort of context, we move to the budget maybe, and in, in, in terms of because of current and capital side to the budget, uh, we have an economy that's that, that's strong and robust at, at the moment. Uh, full employment almost to, to, to a large extent um, and again the government has to wrestle with significant cost of living increases because of the war in Ukraine and, and, and the bounce back from COVID um, uh, a lot of appetite out there from people to, to, get, to seek help from government to alleviate the, the, the pressures yet the risk of inflation stoking inflation What's where, where do you think the balance lies in terms of of, of, of the budget. Yeah, I if think you, it's, it's. If you were framing the budget. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly a balance that, that needs to be struck. Like the, the, the public finances and the government's uh, tax and spending decisions need to be reflective or reflexive. They need to adapt to the environment they find themselves in. It shouldn't be static. Uh, it should always be changing. And clearly, what we've seen uh, in the last number of years has been a, a spike in inflation uh, that we hadn't really seen in, in a long, long time in Ireland. Uh, in fact, with students talking about inflation, you'd have to take your chart back maybe to the 70s and 80s uh, to show them significant yeah. inflation and what it means like what 10-15% inflation means that it means prices doubling uh, every four or five years like we went through a period of almost no overall inflation in Ireland from 2010 right up to uh, the onset of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine then we saw inflation spike above 10% and people saw it pretty quickly, the impact it had, and particularly where that inflation was. Uh, it wasn't 10% across the board. It was highly concentrated in energy uh, because of the impact on global energy prices. And we saw electricity and gas bills um, shooting up. And, and the public finances should be responsive to that. Um, in, in one sense, it, it's perhaps um, counterintuitive, but like inflation is a positive for the public finances because a lot of taxes are based on percentages. Um, but that's not necessarily what the government should be doing in a cost of living crisis. So it's it's right that there should be a response uh, and it should be based on what's happening around. So if we see high inflation, we should be able to see, well, in what way can we mitigate some of that? We can't offset it all uh, because a lot of it is external. Uh, you can look at countries that are running much larger surpluses in Ireland, like Norway being a, a good example. Like They're running a surplus of over 100 billion 
in, in euro terms they have a similar population to us why are they running such a huge surplus well they sell oil and gas yeah. the price of these things on global markets has spiked they're still selling the oil and gas and collecting huge revenues now. so that money is leaving Ireland we're paying more for oil we're paying more for gas uh, and that is a loss of national welfare but what we can do is see well where should that loss be felt the least clearly it should be felt the least at the lower end uh, of the income distribution it has to be sort of shared between certain households, between the government itself, uh, and also businesses. And that balance is a difficult one to strike uh, because, as you see, you don't want to be doing too much where you stoke domestic inflationary pressures. At present, a lot of our inflation uh, is driven by external factors. But if we got to a situation where it was driven by domestic factors, uh, it might affect competitiveness, it might affect some of that investment, and it could become a bit of a spiral. And maybe that chart we show from the 1970s and 80s could come back again. Yeah, and that that is the balance that has to be struck. But I'm also of a view and I've been sharing this for quite some time that uh, given the growth in population over the last two decades in particular and more uh, that inevitably pressures have come on public services be it the health service be it um, education um, and many others Uh, and there's an argument maybe that public service capacity hasn't grown with that Um, and okay we do factor in demographic um, concerns every year in terms of the annual estimates uh, so therefore, at the same time as trying to avoid stoking of domestic inflation, there is an argument, I would argue, in the context of a growing population to try and get our public services uh, up to a level where we're, we're now delivering services for a, a greater number of people. Yeah, I think that's undoubtedly true. A- and again, maybe one problem that the politicians and the policymakers face is, is the inputs they have to, to base these decisions on. Like if you go back to the late 1990s, and we had population projections. You talk about yep. taking demographics into account. And you can look at the, the late 1990s, 25 years ago, and they had population projections for, for 2020, 2021. Population for projection for 2021 was 4 million. Uh, based on a population of around 3.5 million in, in the mid-1990s, they saw it expanding by, by 500,000 in, in the central scenario. So if you sort of base long-term planning on that, as we might have done during the 2000s, you're clearly going to end up with an insufficient level of resources and services for a population that now exceeds 5 million. Um, so again, it, it's, it's probably going back to some of the housing issue that the inputs the policymakers get are, are crucially important. That's a pretty important point. Actually. And so like you can say we're taking the demographics into account. But also then the need for longer term planning. Oh, uh, yes. That, of course, as you're saying, is based on pro- proper uh, or as accurate or precise inputs from a data point of view and forecasting point of view as, as one can get. Which then brings me to the idea of, um, uh, you mentioned Norway, a sovereign wealth fund or a fund that we w- would earn revenue for the state mm. over time. In other words, we're getting a lot of revenue from corporate taxation uh, that may not be permanent. So therefore, the advice is put that aside. I think the Minister for Finance is certainly bring, will be bringing proposals to government on that in terms of uh, putting money aside to earn more to provide for um, pensions, to provide for healthcare costs of this current generation into the future, and also parallel with that, uh, um, uh, an infrastructure climate fund that would mm. make sure that capital spending would be consistent over a much longer period of time. Because what tends to happen when the economy goes down, goes down, or goes into a bad patch, we tend to cut capital first. And so projects that have been in the pipeline for quite some time don't get delivered. Your thoughts on that, uh, your view in terms of putting money aside in terms of a uh, a wealth fund or a fund that earns for the state to provide for the future. Yeah, I guess there are some parallels to, to Ireland and Norway. Uh, now, clearly, in the case of Norway, that the, mm. the, the funds are, are much, much larger. But still, like we're, we're generating a lot of income that's not kind of arising out of the domestic economy. Like From an economic perspective, when we teach sort of the flow of income around the economy, we generally consider taxes to be a withdrawal from the economy. The government is taking money out, taking money out of businesses, taking money out of households, and then will spend that money in provision of public services and the provision of income supports. But if you take the corporation tax in Ireland, it's actually the opposite. It's actually an injection because it's not coming directly out of our pockets. It's coming from the stuff we're making that has been sold by American companies to to markets around the world. That is an injection into Ireland, maybe a bit like the oil revenues uh, that Norway is getting from the offshore oil. Is there a sort of a, a concern about what should be done with that? Um, well, as you say, like we don't really know what will happen with it. Um, and if we can't rely on it, we shouldn't be dependent on it. We don't know what it will be like in three or four years. Should we consider the long term? Like Again, it's a risk. But like much better to be collecting 25 billion of corporation tax and calling it a risk uh, than not collecting it at all. Should our ongoing services be dependent on it? No. Uh, we should be in a position to fund those sustainable services. And Norway seem to have made... 
a disciplined, a long term uh, decision that they weren't going to spend the oil revenue, that they would build up a fund, and it's an enormous fund now. Uh, all the fund would be invested outside of the country, so it wouldn't be subject to political pressure. And the only money they would use would be the income the fund would generate uh, and put that some of that back into the, the, their public finance. They don't even need it all now. Um, and they have high taxes on income, high taxes on oil, maybe perhaps surprising enough, given that they have so much of it, to generate resources sustainably for their own public services and, and public income supports. So you'd like to think that we could move to that position. Yes, I think the idea of a sovereign wealth fund um, is appropriate to build it up and, and maybe as you say draw down the income yeah, that fund that's could earn saying, if yeah, you yeah. invest it and it generates interest or it earns dividends that becomes available whereas the principal amount stays the same I wouldn't be so sure about sort of an infrastructure fund like I do think we have an approach to, to capital spending anyway uh, there is a, a capital budget there um, and yes you're right if a, a crisis was to emerge or downturn to emerge politically uh, cutting capital spending uh, is easier any projects are ongoing you let them finish and you don't start new ones and no one really knows who the losers are. Whereas if you start cutting public sector pay or social welfare supports or increasing taxes, well, people see that much easier. So that's not a problem that's Irish specific. That's a problem internationally. Would it be better if capital spending was smoothed out over the cycle? Absolutely. Um, is a investment fund the way to do that? It's hard to know. Uh, you would like to see that we would have sort of the ability to maintain capital spending during downturns. Uh, like even if you had a so-called uh, infrastructure fund, like would it be guaranteed that the money would only be used for infrastructure? Would it maintain um, capital spending? It's hard to know. It could be you, just a substitute. You can never guarantee anything yeah. in the political world, but our political experience over decades has been that exactly as you've said, we, we go for the capital, we cut the capital in the short term, problem with that is then given the need for significant public transport for example projects that have a long lead in lots of planning issues um, mm. sometimes uh, oral inquiries and so on like that and when you get to that stage and suddenly uh, the, the knife comes down and the project isn't going ahead it's much more expensive than tw 20 years later again when you're still going back to the same project and, and it's likely and to I be too late and it's too late then mm. and we're actually experiencing that now on some road projects and on some public mm. transport projects um, I mean, the idea of a metro was mooted about 30 years ago. Or dark Plus is out there waiting to happen. Uh, there was various uh, light rail projects in, in the regional cities in, in, in Cork and, and Limerick, ultimately, and, and Galway that will be developed. And the only way, and back to your point about certainty, we need to give certainty, I think, to industry, to sector, to construction, that these and, and to those who may tender mm. to provide these projects that actually were in these projects for the long haul. So I think that would be the argument in favour of putting aside funding. And the same for climate. Much of the climate infrastructure will require longer term certainty around finance, particularly around adaptation. If you look at the terrible scenes in Libya at the moment, um, a lot of that is, and I think we're slow, criticise ourselves here as, and across Europe, on adaptation to climate because it's here and now and the impacts are devastating. Mm, yeah, look, so looking forward to the budget, if you're kind of an area where We'd like to see maybe additional resources going from a personal perspective and looking at where we are. It would be the capital side. Obviously, changes have to be made on the current side. You have to respond to the inflation and the, the general environment that we're in. So that means changes in the tax side, changes on the public sector pay, changes on, on social welfare. Like they have to be done just to respond to that. But if there was to be additional uh, funding provided, as you say, out over a medium to long term, uh, the capital side would be one where we can see the benefits. We can see the country is struggling uh, in particular areas, primarily because the population has grown and some of the infrastructure is old and needs updating. Uh, and we have had periods where we under investment and, and invest and maybe find ourselves having to do that bit of catch up. Um, so if that, if you were to say like, what would be one thing in the budget where you would be good to see more resources going to, it would be the capital side. Do you, do you think the existing NDP, the National Development Plan, capital levels are too low? Um, so I think they're, they, they were maybe appropriate for when they were set. Again, like the, the census, like maybe surprised a lot of us in terms of just the mm. size of the population. Not by a huge amount, but again, a bit bigger than we might have yeah. thought yeah. that was there. And you say, well, maybe we do need to sort of bring forward some of these transport plans uh, on, on rail and road. Maybe we do need to look at our schools and our hospitals in terms of are they appropriate for the population that's there. Um, and one issue with, with capital spending is that at the time it can generate a lot of sort of a negative reaction but afterwards, people don't really give out about it. Like, so go back historically, people have given out about the Dublin Port Tunnel That's or they've right. given out about the, <laughs> the, the, the Liffey Bridge or and the Children's Hospital at the moment. Children's Hospital. But like once it's there, like we have a valuable and e 
key piece of infrastructure that we can use. Uh, so while clearly you don't want to be throwing money away, uh, these projects do bring a long-term benefit. Um, and that once they're finished and up and running, we rarely look back and say that wasn't value for money. Like once you have it, and it could be in 10, 15, 20 years, you, you get the value of it. Whereas if you put money into current spending, it's gone. Um, so in terms of what we can do over the next while, no, it's not just a matter of throwing more money at it. No, like yeah. does the economy have the capacity to undertake the work? Where are you going to get the workers? So we might have to say... And then you have your inflationary pressures like, as well. Uh, you know? All these people uh, involved in, in FDI, perhaps all these people involved in building data centres. If we could ease that down a small bit and have more people building houses, would that be a, a beneficial thing? Absolutely. But it's very difficult to do. Easy to sit over here and say it from an economic perspective. Much more difficult to do it from a practical perspective and also difficult to do it from a political perspective. And if so, apart from capital, is there any hobby horse of yours or any particular sort of issue you'd like the budget to address? Um, well, I think what we need to kind of face up to is that the budget has to respond to the environment. If it yeah. sits itself in, and what we currently find ourselves in is an environment where inflation has been sort of elevated for the past while. Uh, and we could get to a situation where you, you adjust the tax system. But I think the tax system should always be changing, particularly the income tax system, due to inflation, due to changes in wages. And really, you want to be keeping your sort of tax system fixed, sort of in kind of post-inflation terms. Um, at times, that can be sold as being a, as a tax cut. But like if somebody has an income increase and they're on the top rate of tax, they're going to be paying a greater share of their income uh, at that higher rate of tax. So their effective tax rate has increased. They've yes. suffered a stealth tax increase. Their Correct. tax rate has gone up. Uh, and if you adjust the tax system to allow for that, that's not necessarily a tax cut. That's bringing them back to where they were. Where they were yeah. And similarly then for the, on the social welfare side, if we have high levels of inflation, particularly energy inflation, um, the, the system should adapt. To, these people are not getting a real increase. We're just keeping pace with what's happening. Uh, so I think... The, the, the overall budget needs to be uh, reflective. I know there can be in academia and maybe some things like that are focused on rules and whether you're complying with them, but you have to uh, reflect the environment you're operating in. Um, and if it's a high inflationary environment, that's the environment in which the budget should be framed. Very good. And just finally, um, when I asked at the outset about threats, challenges to the economy, my sense, I suppose, of my capacity as Minister for Foreign Affairs and indeed Defence now, um, is the geopolitical, the, the, the global challenges are, look fairly immense um, in terms of a major war on the continent of Europe, on, on, on Ukraine, uh, very significant climate change impacts to be seen uh, across the globe, huge problems in Africa, conflict, uh, coup d'etats, um, heightening tensions between US and China, uh, and, and a more firm and robust relationships developing, maybe even protectionism developing as a result of all of that. Um, to me, there are clouds on the global horizon which could impact on a, a small open economy that depends on exports to global markets. Yeah, you're, you're certainly dragging me out of my, my comfort zone with su such huge issues as that. Like from an economic perspective, I think one thing that we could potentially see is more sort of internalisation, countries becoming more insular, uh, increased use of subsidies to support domestic firms, uh, trying to choke off maybe import, or, sorry, exports to the benefit of domestic firms, uh, and maybe from a US perspective, more changes to try and maybe attract yeah. some of this investment uh, back in. Like currently, the rules that are in place um, are, are a big benefit to Ireland. As I say, I don't see any near term risks to a lot of the investment that's happening, but over the medium term, the long term, uh, you could see those things changing. And when it comes to sort of the geopolitical tensions, like we might be sort of removed from them in sort of a distance, but their impact is felt here, whether it's on the, on the price of energy, whether yeah. it's looking at the television and seeing devastation, uh, as we see in Libya at the moment. Like these have either, either effect directly on our incomes and our spending or just on seeing the, the, the difficulties and the trauma uh, that some of the world is going through. So, like, I don't think things are getting any easier. Um and I think maybe our exposure to it is better because of, of media. Um, like the, we're all in a sense a, a journalist now. If you carry your phone, like what, yeah, why are we getting yes. the p images of these? Um, and they all can create problems. Like we might say the economy has performed remarkably well and in a reasonably strong position, but like who's to say what will happen down the line? There are risks there. Um, we'd like to think we're in a position to be able to absorb some of them. And with the overall financial position and surplus we're in, we can. Um, but if the shocks are as large as potentially we can see them happening, um, you could face very severe difficulties. And hence need to provide for that. But Seamus uh, Coffey, thank you very much indeed uh, for a very articulate, if I may say so, insightful presentation 
uh, on both the economy and the challenges facing us and, and, and the forthcoming budget. Uh, um, just what to say to you, you may not be aware, but you're one of the more popular lecturers, lecturers in UCC <laughs> amongst the students. The feedback has always been uh, from generations of students that you've lectured very positive um, in terms of how you engage with them uh, and their sense of your professionalism. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.